Off the Track is brought to you by Windsor Park Stud, your first choice for stallions. Hi and welcome to Off the Track, back for another season. My thanks to Windsor Park Stud and of course, as we mentioned uh, last season, Master Craftsman. And gee, he's on his way, isn't he, up there in the Northern Hemisphere doing a job. We can't wait to the new season here too, when the progeny of Master Craftsman become two. Well, our first guest, as I said in the promos for the show, has never looked better. Kylie Bax, international supermodel. I dare say, Kylie, I better say, welcome back to New Zealand. Oh, thank you so much. It's good to be here. Well, it is. Gee, you've gone full circle, isn't it? isn't it? Eh? You really yeah. have. I mean, you can take the girl out of New Zealand, you can't take New Zealand out of the girl. That's true. That's true. Um, it's so good to be back home. Yeah. And, you know. So How was it? I mean, having lived throughout the world and everything else, you've come back to a place like Cambridge. We haven't even got any traffic lights. I've yeah. got lots of roundabouts, though, <laughs> yeah, haven't yeah. you? Trees, too. Lots trees of trees. and roundabouts and um, friendly people. And it's such a really it's a lovely little community. And yeah. it's always buzzing and vibrant. And oh, I couldn't ask for anything better than that. Uh, spare us. I'm going to talk about your, your husband and Duke. How's he settled? And I mean, the man from Greece uh, coming via Australia back to here. He must like, it's like hitting, well a, hitting the wall. Yeah, he's <laughs> hitting the wall for him. Um, yeah, I, you know. I think it's a big step that he's taken, but he's taking it in a stride. So that's, oh, you know. That's good. And the kids are settled in. Uh, we'll talk all about this a bit later. The, the kids settled? love it. They, uh, they said, Mummy, we're having, the school is fun. Yeah. You know, oh, so that that's thrilling. Yeah, they like that's it. good. Look, uh, this show, I don't know, obviously you probably haven't seen it being on your international travels, but we take you right back, right back to the beginning. Uh, and as everybody's probably aware, you were born in Thames? Yes. Thames Hospital? I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you grew up in Thames. You were the daughter of Graham and Helen Gay. Mm -hmm. uh, Graham was the one that had the interest in racing? Uh, or horses, should I say? Yes, Dad developed the, uh, an interest when I was a very young girl in um, horses. There was nobody before? There was no generation? No. We're not looking at the, the third generation of Baxes that have bred no, horses? No, Dad, Dad was the one that led the way. That was totally uh, his thing. Um, none mm. of his brothers or cousins or... Uncles and aunties were in it. Okay. You had a little property there? You, you grew up on a little property? Um, yeah, we, ha we had a few. We started off with a 10 acre block yeah. at Puri. And then I remember my dad bought another one at Mat uh, Matatoki. Yes. And so the, the block st started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As and the horses as grew. As the horses grew and uh, as he developed. And uh, yeah, he ended up Mata Mata. Uh, were you into ponies and things like that? No. No? No. You loved your horses, though? I just loved my horses and I wanted to be with the foals. And spend time with the foals, and uh, you know. But yeah, yeah, and, and you did a bit of the pedigrees. You're into the pedigrees. I love as the well. pedigrees. I was yeah. actually trying to tell my dad what stallion to go to when I was nine years old. So I think my the first stallion I told my dad to go to was I opened the big stallion books because yeah. at that point they were huge stallion books, yeah. and you had to go through all. The... Dad, the next one you have to take is to Pompey Court. Yeah, Caddo <laughs> Stud. First season sire at that point, and Dad's like, "Oh, really? You know, you don't. Well, for a nine-year-old, you just." Yeah, sure, sure, darling. Yeah, you know, yeah, okay. there you go. You were the oldest of three. Um, I'm the oldest, yes. And uh, I have a brother and sister. Brother and sister. Were they interested in horses? I know your you, you younger sister worked for New Zealand Bloodstock for a while. You, you, your middle brother, I think, uh, was pretty good at golf. Very yeah. good at golf. He was a golf pro in yeah. uh, Florida. He actually travelled around, um, and he worked for the Nick Faldo Institute. Okay. For quite a and while. he's come back. I've seen him at the sale, so he's he's yes, now right yes, involved. Yes, yep, he's involved. Um, he actually, is an insurance agent right now. Right, so which is in line away. with your father's exactly. side of things. Exactly. So they work together in the offices in Matamata half a week each. So, well, that's good. Hey, listen, how'd you go at school? What were you like? Primary I was school. not. I was good. I liked primary school very yeah. much. Um, I had lots of friends, and you know. Typical kid. I, I first met you. You were at Dyson College, mm. and how, when did you come over to, to Hamilton? Um, Dio. Um, when I was uh, when I was turned thirteen. Yeah. My high school years, and I was a boarder there um, until I finished in a sixth form. Uh, my one memory of you, apart from the fact that you offered me a job as your racing manager when you became <laughs> successful, was the fact that you were singly driven. You had a, had goals in life, didn't mm, you? Yeah. You really did. No. But you were very interested in marketing. You like marketing. Yes. Well, I love my horses. Yeah. And that's where that came from because I wanted to market my horses and be involved in really pushing and promoting the horses that that were were ours at, at that point. And um, yeah, I was enthralled by the. 
the bloodstock agents and uh, <laughs> that they get to go around with horses all the time and inspect horses and, you know, just deal in horses and that's... Yeah, I should have taken you up on that job, uh, I reckon. I should have taken the job. Never too late, never too yeah, late. Yeah, never too late. Hey, listen, there's an opportunity always. Hey, listen, uh, in terms of that marketing, I, I had a chat to uh, our sponsor, uh, Windsor Park, well, Nelson, Nelson. Schick, actually, from, uh, and he tells me that you sent out, or got them to send out, a photo of you holding a, a yearling that was coming up for the sales under their draft yes. and sent it out some of their bigger clients. That was my first marketing promo. I remember what I was wearing and everything. I was wearing a red T-shirt and, and, you know, jeans, blue yeah. powder blue jeans, really trendy at the time with shoulder pads, I believe. <laughs> I had shoulder pads. Um, <laughs> and there I was holding, holding the Starway, Starway Philly. Mm -hmm. And um, so yes, it was uh, it, it was very interesting because Sterling Smith, Smith, that's right. Yep, he came nephew of the great Tommy Smith, yep, the late great. Yep. Yep. he came to uh, Nelson to the to Windsor Park, and he said, "Where's Kylie?" Mm -hmm. You know, because there I was promoting this. I'd, that he was a good judge this. of a horse, and obviously a good judge He'd of the filly. He saw so the to horse, speak. and you know, was wanting to talk to me about it. Hey, listen, uh, your interest in horses obviously coming through from your father, and no disrespect to Graham, but it's uh, probably apt that, uh, or fortunate that you threw to your mother in terms of the looks. <laughs> eh? Your mother was an absolutely beautiful woman. Uh, she was Miss Thames Valley? Mm hmm. Yes, yeah. she was. Yep. And I mean, uh, there you are. I mean, are you. Uh, no, I've never asked. I was Miss Thames Valley 20 years after her. Were you? Mm -hmm. There you go, you see. I never realised, I've never asked Helen Gay this, but have you, in effect, your life, which we're going to talk about, have you lived the dream, her dream, so to speak? I mean, oh, I don't is this know. something that, you, um, that she may have aspired to herself that you've actually achieved? Oh, I really don't know. I think, I think that, uh, yes, maybe. She, um, she did a lot of travelling when she was young anyway. She travelled the world on the big ships with her parents yeah. right up till she was 21. Um, so she got to do small parts in movies and everything, but she did, she did come back here and eventually I was born. So He must be a very good talker, your father. He must be a very good salesman. <laughs> he's a pretty good salesman. <laughs> he's an insurance agent. I know. He's, an <laughs> he's got very horses. Good. Yeah. He's got uh, so you had this wonderful... <laughs> now, listen, everywhere I've, everywhere I've read, and you can confirm this, and this, as we go through, this has been the case, because, I mean, I've done a, a bit of research, and is that you were found in a, a shopping centre identified by Klein Management, was it? Uh, well, what happened was that I did enter into Miss Thames Valley Coromandel. Right. And I entered it because my mum had won it 20 years before and I just wanted to win it. I'm mm. that kind of person. Yeah. So um, I entered and the, one of the judges um, was uh, Klein Management, from Klein Management. And he's, I won the competition mm -hmm. and he said, no, you know what, instead of going to Miss Universe, you need to start your modelling career. So I abdicated and I gave it to my cousin who got runner up. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, how was that with family time at Christmas? <laughs> Your cousin, I'm number one. You know, I gave it to you. Is that right? Oh, no, it was all good. See, I, I, you see, I had this vision when they say you were found in a shopping centre of a bloke in a you know, little box brownie, you know, with a long overcoat with uh, lollies and a business cards, <laughs> preying on pr pretty 15-year-olds. But that's not quite how not it quite happened. Not quite right. No, no, no. But, uh, so talk me through this. How is it you go from uh, being found as such in this uh, Miss Thames Valley in the competition to to going to New York. It seems such a, a big jump. Um, it was, yeah, I, I, I was the only one that wanted to go to New York. From everybody, that Klein minute, from that... Everybody yeah. wanted to send me to Paris. Um, Who's everybody? Well, part the, of the my team? agents and... So you got agents already by this stage? I had stage. an agent. Are you talk, we're talking agent. 15, 16 here? No, we're talking 18. 18, mm -hmm. okay. 17, 18. 17, 18. Yeah. So, yeah, they just wanted to send me to, to Paris. And I said, look, there's no way I'm going to Paris. If I'm going to go to be at the top, I'm going to New York where the girls make it. And if I make it, I make it. If I don't, I'm coming back here to market my horses. Okay. And that's, those were my words. All right. And so when you went to New York, I'm trying to think back. Did, did your mother go with you to start with? Uh, she did go with me for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And to then settle she, in, to bed you in, so to speak. She was like, come home with me. And I said, nope. Is that right? I'm staying here. Bye, Mum. Yeah. yeah. So you've done a little bit of work, modelling work here in New Zealand, obviously getting a bit of work ex experience mm. or something. Because everywhere I read, they said that you were, you found that you were naive. Uh, oh, very naive. Going in, that, the only model you'd ever heard of was a, a Linda Evangelista. Was yeah, that right? we, we, I went to boarding school and um, really didn't have much access to magazines, fashion magazines, and everything. I did recall seeing Linda, um, knew about Linda, um, and that was pretty much it. I, I'm very naive. I didn't know much about fashion at all. So you teamed up, Klein sent you over there, did you, did you end up with a, an agency over there? 
Uh, they actually Stuart Cameron scouted me from Australia, and Stuart Cameron was Al McPherson's manager. Okay. And um, so I actually went to Australia for to see an agency over there, and my agent and one of those women who was a photography agent, she mentioned it to Stuart Cameron, and Stuart Cameron then saw me and said to women management in New York, "You've got to take this girl." Right. So Stuart Cameron was already had an office in New, in New York City with women, and basically I went there as one of Stuart, as Stuart's other. Okay, I've, there's a couple of people that I've read about, uh, and one I, in fact, I see in the Herald, he's regarded as the fashion guru, Karl Lagerfeld. Hmm. Uh, Stephen Meisel, though, was is a photographer. Stephen Meisel, yeah. Yeah, Meisel. Who did you work with first? First, did you work with Stephen Meisel? I worked with Stephen first. You did the Vogue, which hmm. I read about was just. So what happens when you get over there? When I got over there, it was May. And what they do, the agencies, is they test the girls to see how good they're going to be. So all the new girls go in May. They stay at a modelling uh, house. We're talking hundreds, thousands? Oh, of... we're talking maybe ten. Yeah. Um, and they test and they get to see, and the, the photographers who are testing them and the stylists say, yeah, this girl's going to make it or this girl's not going to make it. So I got thumbs up. Mm -hmm. And basically, they. So, is it like? A, could I just say, is this like that uh, supermodel, like a, the reality TV show, in an effect, was going <laughs> on in those days without the TV coverage? Yeah. Would that be right? Yeah. Well, we didn't have cell phones or anything like that either back then. So, but you're in there <laughs> competing. You're living in a house together with all these other girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, my house flooded too. I was living on the ground floor, a basement under one yeah. level under. There was a huge storm and and uh, it flooded. I remember waking up and, and and my portfolio was floating around the, the room. I had to bail out. There was nobody else. All the girls had gone out to party. Yeah. And um, you I was didn't, bailing of out. I didn't. No, yeah. True professional. Yeah. But yeah, I was bailing out in the middle of the night. And I was like, you know what? I've got to get my own place. So that's what I did. And, and in fact, we got a photo here. These are one of this is this photo shoot you did with. Stephen Marshall on Vogue. Yes, yes. And you, I mean, I read your blog about it. It was an incredible experience. Mm. Yeah, I worked with him many, many times. Um, the first time I worked, the, the first, one of the first times I worked with him was a 23-page editorial for Vogue. Italian Vogue. Yeah. And um, it was two covers. And that was just the biggest thing. I mean, when you work with Stephen Mizell, that's it. that's your career made. But not only did I work with him once, I worked with him over and over again, like maybe at least twice a month. See, what makes him so good? You know, because I was thinking about this. Does I mean, an attractive girl make a good photographer? Because I mean, I could take a photo of you and it's going to look good. Or can a good photographer make a, a, a plain girl look sensational? Is it? Yeah. What, what is more important? It's more the fact that the girl has to be photogenic. She can be as gorgeous. Yeah. is the most gorgeous woman in the world, but she has to be photogenic. So that's the key. And then the photographer's got to be good. He's got to know how to light, you know, got direct. Um, mm. You know, he, Stephen Marizal is great because he directs everybody. He he directs from the hair to the makeup. He knows what he wants. So he's, he's you know, he's that kind of person. So you're getting an entourage right? You've got a management. Have you got an entourage? I mean, by this stage, you've got a PA, have you got a hairstylist, have you got, you know, people there around yeah, you? You have people around you, but I never had a personal assistant. All the other girls had a personal assistant. I'm terribly, I, I like to control what I do and make sure that I don't go outside what I can actually manage. So I actually did most of everything myself. Um, and I was always working 24-7. I was you see, that's, it, that's what I've read. See, they yeah. said the thing that set you apart from the others, you worked. Your work mm. ethic was outstanding. Does that come back to that Kiwi, that Kiwi I background? I think so. I think so. I think, you know, I've, I'm, I left New Zealand. I have to make it in New York. What am I going to do? I'm here in New York working, now. Working, working, working. There's no th such thing as failure. I mean, the covers, I mean, they are immense, the, the, the different ones that you have done, Vogue, Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, Vanity Fair, Al. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I mean, that's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think out of all of those that you just named, I think the most was, was Vogue. I've done quite a few Vogue covers yeah. all over. In terms of getting on Vogue, I mean, the money's coming in, OK? Who was assisting in that side of things? Because I did see an interview where you see every supermodel, every model should be thinking of that end day. They should mm. be working towards that final day. Who was assisting? Was that your dad or was that again uh, Yeah, I think that was just learning. I, I was a big listener when I was a kid, so yeah. listen and learn and, 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 yeah. So I think dad was... You know. Were you surprised how much money was available to be earned? Um, yeah, I, I mean, when you do the editorials, you don't actually get paid. You get a couple hundred dollars, but that's prestige, and that would lead to the advertising. And mm. thing. But when I was working, and it was just the money was unbelievable. So Much better than what it is now. Is that right? Mm. And I, I, I saw you say somewhere it was fun back then, whereas I, it's I not fun it. now. I mean, for the um, girl, girls coming through. That's the I did, It's just a big turnover now, just like... <laughs> Turning it right? over all the time, yeah. I think it's a, it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. 
Hey, um, I, let's, I want to talk about Carl Alford, who was in the Herald yesterday, which is opportune. Uh, oh. You know, just they did the. Uh, he was reported as changing your look mm. to the short cropped hair, and and was the one. Is, is that right? Is, is that is no that disrespect right? to Carl because I love Carl very, yeah. very, very much. But the first time I walked into my modelling agency in Women in New York, I was wearing cowboy boots that were terrible, by the way and jeans, and I just looked like I came from the farm, which was fine, because what they did to me was they said, OK, sit here, and my agent um, at the time, he, um, Paul Rowland, he sat me down. I mean, you've got to think, I was with Kate Moss agents. There were everybody, every, all the girls were there. He sat me down in a stool in the middle of the agency, and he chopped my hair off. And not many girls would let anybody cut their hair, let alone an agent. He wasn't even a hairstylist. So there you go. So I just said, you know what? I'm here, I'm here to make it big, you do what you think, that get me to that next level. And so that's... So, so it was Carl or not? Or there was, it, it was my agent who chopped my hair off first and it was yeah. Stephen Mizell who coloured my hair white, who made me go to the salon, Garen Salon in New York. Okay. And Garen took me, he cut it to his style, I mean Garen's the top in the world, and he, he, he coloured my hair, they had my hair coloured. So Bleach. you became, uh, there was perfumes, um, happy, happy. Is it happy. Clinique happy. Massive income off the, I mean, is it, I mean, I don't want to ask. And it's, I mean, save just the pennies, I have to save, save the, the pennies. Save the pennies, yeah. Because things, and, and how many years, I mean, is there a life expectancy, I mean, those sort of things? I mean. Oh, there's, there is, there's a life expectancy. You have to plan for the future about what you want to do. I mean, I don't think I always wanted to be a model all the time for mm -hmm. the rest of my life. I did want to have any, the horses and everything outside of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, progress, is there, is there a situation where you, did you go to a photo shoot where you said, look, I'm not just not going to do that, or did you just <laughs> oh, go with bitch. everything? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. Um, you know? No, no. I mean, there's, there, of course, there's one or two scenarios where you're like, oh, gosh, do I have to do that? Yeah. Um, but you do it. That's your yeah. job. And, and Catwalk stuff, did that? All of that. Many, many shows. Many shows. Gucci, Versace, Prada. I did all the shows. I remember that you had conjunctivitis. They're oh, my gosh. Beautiful. I remember reading about this. That, you know, this is horribly thing I, I, painful. Yeah. And, and it, it was so bad because nobody diagnosed me with it. The French doctors didn't know what was going mm. on at all. But, yes, I did the runway show. Um, Fabrizio Ferri, I did his, his runway show with sunglasses, big, big sunglasses on. Because um, I was just in horrible pain. It was just, uh, you know, terrible. Oh, well. But I worked through it. You did work through it. She loves working. <laughs> well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is uh, Kylie Bax. We're going to take a break here on Off the Track and we'll continue on the life and times of international supermodel Kylie Bax. Mm -hmm.